Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 74 of the American Wrestling Experience. My name is Zach Anderson, and I'm here with my partner, Provez Ahmed. Hey, welcome back, listeners. Uh, uh, good, to, good to be back. And, uh, well, it's good to be here in the beautiful facilities of Hub 925 in Pleasanton, California. That's right. It was great listening to our episode last time um, that we recorded here, our, our sort of virgin uh, voyage. Um, and uh, it was great to just hear the crispness of the audio and and all of that so um thank you again to the good folks at hub 925 uh well it's it's very exciting to be here and and we are recording this is the morning after yeah christmas this is so a, a christmas of an episode as we got a, a charlie brown christmas special there yeah, you this go is our <laughs> diffuse congruence but it won't christmas be special. it won't be 60 minutes of wah, 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 wah. right at least we Ho- hope not. hopefully hopefully, hopefully that's not what yeah, you hear right. when you're <laughs> listening uh, and we're very excited to be joined by our returning guest, Dr. Ali Atai. And if I'm not mistaken, this is momentous because this is the fastest turnaround that we have ever had. Right? This is like what I don't. I, when, two episodes. Two episodes. We only have one episode between you and the last time you were on. So that tells us something <laughs> because because there were things that were left unsaid. Well, this is we I call tend this to do that, yeah. we call this episode unfinished business. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> But this I is don't fun. even know how to segue from that, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, but this is fun. This is going to be a really interesting conversation. That's and right. Uh, I, I, you know, like the idea was was to have uh, Dr. Atai on um, just uh, in time for the holidays to talk about um, Christmas. <laughs> no, uh, but in a sense, um, because I think that um, oftentimes, um, whether it's for listeners of other faiths or even I think for Muslim listeners. Um, you know the what is the sort of what is sort of Islam's normative position uh, mm. on Jesus and Christ and Jesus of Nazareth. Um, I, I, th- I wanted to have a conversation about that, and, and I think maybe we could segue that into conversations related. But um, mm-hmm. I guess that's kind of a starting place. Is um, and I don't know where you where we can start with that. I mean, I, I have some ideas, but uh, yeah. if there's any place that you think would be a good beginning with regards to maybe just establishing. The sort of, I think I think there's a, a sort of a set of things that I think all Muslims kind of know just being in this kind of interfaith or multi-faith um, context of, of talking points that they have with regards to all Muslims believe hmm. that Jesus was hmm. so-and-so. So mm-hmm. I, I think those are kind of, I think we can dispense with, you know, like dispense with those because those are pretty easy. Uh, I, I think where it gets a little dicey is, is, is with regards to Probably the crucifixion. I think most people, yeah. uh, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, uh, kind mm. of um, there's a, a set of things that they believe with regards to Jesus prior to the events of the crucifixion. Which yeah, you, yeah, would you it's an interesting that? topic. Yeah, um, it's it's quite a divisive topic. I think it's probably the uh, the the biggest difference, other than the. Uh, supposed deity of Jesus is what actually happened to him. Hmm. You know, Christians always point out um, from the very beginning, John of Damascene, John ja- Damascene, or John of Damascus, as he's called in the eighth century, pointed this out as well uh, that Muslims uh, categorically deny the historicity uh, of the crucifixion based on his understanding of the text. Um, there's an interesting uh, point that. Uh, Todd Lawson makes in his book, um, The Quran and the Crucifixion, that the oldest extant uh, denial of the crucifixion in writing actually comes from John Damascene, mm-hmm. although there are certainly things attributed to Muslim authorities before him, like there's something attributed to Ibn Abbas, um, which is basically the most popular theory, uh, because the problem here is there, there's a very enigmatic a statement in the Quran uh, that nobody really knows what to do with. Well, I can should be alone, right? So, what do you do with that statement? It was made. He was made to appear so. It was made to appear so. It was made dubious to them. Um, so, the way that Ibn and this, you know, the tafsir of Ibn Abbas is dubious by itself. I mean, there's many ulama, classical ulama, that doubt whether Ibn Abbas actually wrote that, mm-hmm. um, but. He subscribes to the substitution theory that someone else was uh, transfigured, I call it supernatural identity transference, um, to look like Jesus and this person was crucified. And that's how he interprets, well, I can show be a lahum, and this is mentioned by Imam At-Tabari in his encyclopedic super commentary where he ha- basically has a survey of all these opinions um, of Ibn Abbas and things that are attributed to Qatada and Mujahid and Asuddi. Um, Ibn Ishaq, 
Uh, Imam Tabari's final opinion, however, is um, a tradition that goes back to Wahab ibn Munabbih, who was a Yemeni um, <coughs> scholar, re reputed to have been a scholar of Judaism and Islam. Now, if you, if you actually engage with classical authorities as to the reputation of Wahhab, you get everything from trustworthy to brazen liar. Uh, and there are many, many things attributed to him. Uh, but the one that Imam Tabari really likes is uh, that, um, that all of the disciples of Jesus, uh, they scattered when Jewish authorities came to arrest him, um, except for one disciple. Uh, and then this sole disciple was supernaturally transfigured mm -hmm. to look like Christ, uh, and then volunteered, obviously, to be crucified. And that's, that's his final opinion. Now, what's also interesting is if you study the history of the exegesis of this ayah, and I call it ayah to salb, the, the verse of the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. There's only one explicit right. mention of the crucifixion in the entire Quran, and there's no hadith that is sahih and marfu'ah, in other words, that is rigorously authenticated in its isnad that goes back to the Prophet ﷺ uh, that has any details as to what actually happened. Um, uh, so... Um, so uh, you, you don't get to, uh, when you get to Imam al-Razi, uh, many, many years later, you finally have, you know, once in a while an exeget will sort of hit, uh, what is it, exegetical pay dirt with something and, uh, and you know, it problematize sort of the standard interpretation of mm -hmm. things. Imam al-Razi says that's unacceptable for God to, to supernaturally um, um, transfer someone's identity onto someone else because we depend on our senses hmm. uh, in um, in uh, you know in jurisprudential yeah. issues and court proceedings and so on and so forth. So he doesn't like that. He, he considers it a type of deception that God would do, and he finds it unacceptable. Okay. So he he doesn't like that standard sort of substitution theory. Uh, Imam Azamakhshari, who is a Mu'tazili right, uh, exeget, he has something interesting to say as well, although he does repeat all the sort of standard substitution legends. He does say, walakin shubi allahum, he says here that the conceptual uh, subject of shubbiha, because shubbiha is a, is a, is a hapax legomenon, it doesn't appear anywhere else in the Quran, nobody knows what to do with it really, mm. Mm. but he says the wow. conceptual subject is not Jesus, other, otherwise, it would mean that Jesus was made to look like somebody else, not the other way around. So substitution becomes untenable, according to Zamakshari. So what he says here is I that these, the conceptual subject of Shubbiha is the event of the crucifixion itself. Mm -hmm. That the crucifixion was made dubious to the enemies of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then what do you do with Wama Qataluhu Wama Salabuhu? Well, interestingly enough, um, uh, we'll put that aside for now. But there are things that are attributed to Jafar al-Sadiq, who is the great, 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 great grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi where he actually affirms the historicity of the crucifixion. Mm. Um, uh, what's interesting is that uh, the Twelver Shia, uh, almost all of them deny the crucifixion, even though uh, they claim to take from his... And there's some question of whether it's uh, authentic or not. Certainly Todd Lawson calls it pseudo-Jafar. He, he doesn't think it's, it's authentically from Jafar al-Sadiq. Who but would he, be the fourth imam, right? The four, uh, Jafar al-Sadiq, I think yeah. he is, would be the, fourth or fifth. the fifth imam. Yeah, fourth, yeah. fifth, okay, fifth. The fifth imam, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so he apparently affirms the crucifixion. Zaidi Shia and Ismaili Shia, they confirm the crucifixion. The Ikhwan of Safa, for example, who are a group of, I think it's translated, the Brethren of Purity. Mm -hmm. uh, they were basically synthesizers of Greek philosophy and Islamic theology. And in their, they have a series of writings called the Risala, or the Rasail. And in one of them, in one Risala, they, they basically just paraphrase the Gospel of John. Because mm. uh, they fully accept that these four uh, books in the New Testament is the authentic Injil. And they just basically go through it and say, yes, Jesus was he was he was he died on the cross, and then he was he was um, resurrected by God, and then he ascended to heaven. So those are the Ismailis. Now, what's interesting is it appears as though Imam Al Ghazali also accepts the historicity of the crucifixion uh, because his opinion and there's uh, it's it's different to pin him down because sometimes he sort of entertains the arguments of his opponents to argue against them. Uh, but it appears as if he accepts 
that the or affirms the text of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as the Injil, uh, and in that case would affirm the crucifixion. Um, uh, so scholars have um, debated as to you know why he would take that position. Oftentimes he'll study the the uh, the uh, the positions of his theological opponents. And he won't completely reject all of their opinions. He might actually take a few opinions from them. <clears throat> and that's what appears to have happened uh, here. Um, but I, I think the key to understanding this ayah, 4157, ayah to salb, is, uh, is two things. I think it's philology. I think we have to study uh, language as it's being used in the Quran, and also subtext. Um, so I'll give you an example. Um, in the Quran, the word tawaffa um, is used 25 times. It's, it's a form five verb, tawaffa. And one of the meanings, it's 23 out of the 25 times that it's used in the Quran. Uh, and you can read those ayat. It means physical, biological death. It's mm. very, very clear. Mm. There is an ayah where it's used to denote um, a process by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will seize a person's soul but the person will remain sleeping, and then he'll return the soul to the person, right? So in Lisan al-Arab ibn Mandur, he, he defines the word, uh, the verb tawaffa as qabad Allahu ruha, or nafsa, that God seizes the nafs or the soul. Uh, that's somewhat ambiguous. Uh, but if you look at other places in the Quran, by far this, this verb actually means physical death. Um, so that's one thing. In 355 of the Quran, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking to Isa alayhi salam directly, inni mutawafika wa rafi'uka ilayya. Right? Even Imam Tabri here, he says, this could mean physical death. Hmm. Right? He actually admits that. So does Ibn Kathir. But they say, in that case, you have to read, these, you have to read that statement backwards. Mm -hmm. yeah, they call it a taqdimul um, mu'akhar uh, or something like that. Where it really means in rafi urka ilayya wa wa mutawafika that that I will uh, cause you to ascend first uh, because I saved you from the crucifixion and then later towards the end of time at the parusia after the second coming then I'll cause you to die. Uh, so I'm not really convinced by that. To be honest with you, I don't think we need to do, do these types of acrobatic, syntactical mm -hmm. acrobats mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. gymnastics. Mm -hmm. I think clearly it says, I will take your soul, mm -hmm. I will cause you to die, uh, and then I will raise you. Now, what, the, what, is the, what is the nature of this raising? Mm -hmm. Could it mean God will raise his soul from him, raise his body, body and soul? Will he raise his, his rank? Imam al-Razi also mentions in his tafsir that the rifa' of Isa alayhi salam mentioned Bal Rafa Allahu ilay is actually a raising of his reputation, his stature, his mm. rank. Mm. Uh, very much like what a fa'na like a dhikrak. Yeah, exactly. Um, so philology is really important understanding the, the, the ayah. And then uh, subtext is really important, I think the most important. So um, it's very, very important for the Quran to be read and understood uh, in its theological milieu. Right, oftentimes the Quran is responding to uh, Jewish and Christian tradition or texts um, that uh, were very prevalent uh, in the late antiquity. I'll give you one example. There's a story in Surah 27 of the Quran of the Queen of Sheba, who's not named in the Bible, but in the Quran, she's uh, well, in the tradition. She's not named in the Quran either, right. but in the tradition, she's known as Bilqis. Um, and so she was in the palace of Solomon, Suleiman alayhi salam, and uh, she was walking across the pavilion, and she, she, uh, she thought there was some water, right, um, on, the, on the ground there. So she tucked up her skirt, exposing her shins, the Quran says. Um, so, you know, I, I read that story years ago, and I asked one of my teachers, well, well what does that mean? Why is that there? And he said, well, you know, he didn't really have an answer. And he sort of said, it sort of just means, t you, know, to the, you know, as a sort of advice to the young women mm. to stay covered, right? Mm. And so well, what, else is, what else does it mean? Is that, is that the significance? Is that the main? He said, well, I don't, I don't really know. And well, it turns out that uh, it was very prevalent uh, um, amongst uh, 
uh, Coptic Christians, and there's also traditions in Talmudic Judaism that the Queen of Sheba was half demon hmm. and that she had hooves for legs. Oh, how interesting. <laughs> wow. So in order to sort of prove to his household that she wasn't a, a demon and that he did not consort with evil women, he played this ruse on her, <laughs> making it seem like there was, um, it was a glassy floor, but made it seem like there's, it's a, there's actually water there so that she might expose her shins. So you wouldn't know that unless you're familiar with these um, Judeo-Talmudic traditions that were prevalent in the late antiquity at the time, and that's mm. just one example. Mm. Um, so if we look at these, if we look at Ayat al-Sal before 157, uh, and the Ayat that comes before it, um, where Ayat al-Buhtan, where Maryam is uh, the 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 um, the slander against Maryam alayhi salam, if you read that section in the Quran, it's clearly responding to um, Talmudic Jewish narratives. Uh, so, in tra for example, in tract Tractate 43a of the Babylonian Gemara, which is the Talmud, mm -hmm. it says that uh, Yeshu, that's what, it, that's what it calls Jesus, was hanged on the eve of Passover, right? But if you keep reading that, and hanged is a euphemism for crucifixion, but if you keep reading um, what the rabbis say there, they say that we stoned him to death we killed him, and then we crucified him post mortem, hmm. right? And that's, and you know, there's a really good book by Peter Schaefer, who's at Princeton, who calls this a deliberate counter narrative. So the rabbis that are writing this, mm -hmm. they know it's not true, but they want to take, they want to own Jesus as as a, her a Jewish heretic. Mm -hmm. So it's a false narrative. It's a false counter narrative. Mm -hmm. If you keep keep reading in the same tractate, um, it says that. Uh, Maryam alayhi salam astaghfirullah played the harlot with carpenters. So there's the buhtan, there's the sort of uh, the false charge against Mary. Right. So here in the Quran, you have wa qawli wa bi kufrihim wa qawlihim ala Maryam buhtan an azima. And for their infidelity and, and, their, and their statement against Mary. So obviously here the Quran is responding to these counter narratives, these false narratives in the Talmud. Yeah. And then the very next ayah, so these two ayahs are, are connected semantically. him mm. Rasulullah. In that latter part, you know, we we killed, they said in boast, we killed the so called Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of God. Even as the Makhshari says, they don't really mean to call him the Messiah. That's kind of like what Pharaoh says to Moses, this so-called apostle of yours. Hmm. He doesn't believe he's an apostle. They okay. wouldn't kill someone they believe <coughs> to be the Messiah. I see. Right. Now notice the, the order here. Mm -hmm. They did not kill him by stoning, nor did they crucify him after post-mortem. But it was made, the event of the crucifixion was made dubious to them. In other words, it seems like the Quran is actually affirming the Christian crucifixion narrative and saying in the Christian crucifixion narrative, it appears as if he had been killed by you, right? So it's completely repudiating the, the Talmudic, narrative, Talmudic narrative, but it is sort of um, reinterpreting in a novel way the Christian crucifixion narrative that, that God seized the soul or the, the ruh. And it's interesting because if you read the four gospels in the New Testament, um, at the moment of the death of Jesus, uh, none of the gospel authors say that he died on the cross. They don't use that word, hmm. right? They use a euphemism. Now, I'm not saying that they're, that they're saying that he didn't die, but they don't like that word. And, and there's a word in Greek for die uh, that is very, very apothnesco, I think. It's used 122 times in the New Testament, so they were familiar with that word. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of them, they say something to the effect of, he lifted up or yielded up or let go of his spirit, hmm. of his pneuma, okay. right? And then in the Quran, inni mutawafika, I will hmm. seize your soul. Hmm. So um, the way that I sort of read that is that he might have died on the cross, but he wasn't killed on the cross, hmm. right? The, the, hmm. He didn't okay. die from crucifixion, that God intervened, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intervened and seized his soul. Yeah. It might have even returned it. Actually, there's actually a, a tradition of Wahhab that goes Wahhab ibn Munabbi, and is mentioned by Ibn Kathir, where he says that Jesus might have died on the cross, and three days later, his 
Mm. Soul was returned to him, then he was resurrected, and then he was ascended. And Ibn Kathir says, no, he categorically rejects it. Mm. You know, but it's also attributed to Wahhab ibn Munabbi. Uh, what's also interesting is that uh, modern uh, Muslims, uh, like reformist Muslims, you read like Sayyid Qutub and Rashid al-Ridha, Muhammad Abdu, all of them are quoting from this book called The Gospel of Barnabas, right. yeah. Injil Barnaba, right? Um, which is a, a total disaster, in my opinion. Huh. Um, I mean, Sayyid Qutub in his, in his tafsir, Fi Dilal al-Quran, he refers to the Gospel of John as gabir, as disgusting, and you know, he says it's written way too late, and so on and so forth, which is very interesting because you, know, you have these four Gospels that are written in the first century, Right, um, and apparently, you know, it's it's false and it's fabricated and adulterated. But then the Gospel of Barnabas, which is written, uh, there, I mean, there's no, there's zero textual witnesses to the Gospel of Barnabas that predate the 16th century, and it's written in Italian, and there are doctrinal errors in that text. I mean, it calls the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam al Messiah. Mm. So that's that's wrong. There are anachronisms. I mean, yeah. it talks about the 40 day fast of Lent in the Gospel of Barnabas, which <laughs> wasn't around until the 5th century or so, hmm. but, um, but places that practice in 1st century Palestine, which is an anachronism. Um, so it seems like with these modern Mufassirin, um, they kind of buy into this idea of a clash of civilizations, the East versus the West, Christianity versus Islam. So they, they are at pains to... to um, to uh, oppose Christianity at every turn. I mean, if mm. it sounds like Christianity, just just don't. Uh, and I don't think that's I don't think that's a good, obviously not a good method. I think if there's a way of reading the text that agrees with the Christian text, I mean, I mean, so what? Let the conclusions take us where they will. That's right. I mean, it says in 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 Bukhari, and people always ask the question, you know, you know, the Quran. It says Al Injil, right? Yeah. Uh, but the, the Christians believe in anajil. Uh, the Quran says the gospel singular, uh, but the, the Christians believe in gospels. So, you know, obviously the Quran is talking about some original revelation that was revealed to Christ uh, in the Syriac language, which is now lost. Um, so how could this be authentic? And Well, it's interesting because if you read um, in Bukhari, Waraka bin Nawfal, I might have mentioned this last time I was here, it, Bukhari um, describes Waraq ibn Nawfal. Of course, he was a cousin of Khadija al Kubra. He was, That's right. It says, Wa kana He was a man who converted to Christianity. al Injil bil Arabiya. That he mm. used to read the gospel in Arabic. Mm. Mm. So, what is he reading? Is, is he reading some archetype in Syriac that only he had access to? Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, he sort of hid it away. And what is he reading? So, the question is, why does the Quran and Hadith use the singular Injil? Well, I think it's very, I think a little bit of research gives the answer. Uh, there was a gospel harmony that was done in Syriac in the second century by a man named Tatian. He was a student of Justin Martyr, one of the um, pioneers of, of uh, Logos Christology. His student was named Tatian. So basically what he did is took Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and he put them into one narrative, a gospel harmony. It's called the Dia Tesseron. Now the Dia Tesseron, according to Western scholars, uh, was probably the most uh, popular form of the New Testament gospels in Arabia during the Quran's milieu. So it's a single gospel, but it's a harmonization of all four gospels. It's a fourfold gospel. Mm -hmm. So this is probably what the Christians, uh, this, is prop this is most likely what Waraka is reading and translating, Tatian's Diatessaron from Syriac into Arabic, which is a single gospel. So the Quran is in fact confirming Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but it's in one form, it's in one narrative, you see. Uh, so um, I think a little bit of, of research will, will reveal that. And it's interesting because in, in Tatian's Diatessaron, <coughs> you have the first five verses of the hymn to the Logos. Um, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and I would say that sancred, sanctified or divine, lowercase d, was the Word, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly it switches to the birth of John the Baptist. I mean, that's the order in Tatian's Diatessaron. In the Quran, we have the, the, uh, the story of John the Baptist, and within that story, you have a reference to the Logos. Musaddiqan min Allah. So it seems like it's mirroring what's happening in the Diatessaron. 
that 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 uh, John is um, uh, confirming the fact that yeah. Jesus was the Word. The Word, yeah, yeah. 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 Which so in in the Quran, I mean, I don't know where uh, if it's in in, in con or in relation to this particular verse about John, mm. where the Prophet Isa uh, describes himself as as the Word of God. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Kalimat I mean, uh, um, Allah or something. Yeah, right? ca- yeah, and there's and then in Surah Maryam there's a Kalimatu uh, Minhu. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. there's a, there's a, a story of Isa alayhi salam and then Thalika Isa ibn Maryam, Qawl al Haq alladhi fihi yamtun. Qawl al Haq is the accusative according to some of the Qiraat, mm-hmm. which would mean the aforementioned story about Jesus is true, but some of the early uh, Qaris they would read that in the Marfur, um, in the nominative. In that case, it's a direct reference to Jesus as the word of mm. the truth. And al-haq would mean, would mean Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. And it's also mentioned going back to the crucifixion. Yeah. Uh, they did not kill him nor crucify him. In reality, in other words, on the surface, that's what appeared to have happened. Okay. That we killed the Messiah. But in reality, that didn't happen. And I think I mentioned this last time I was here as well. Imam al-Ghazali mentions uh, Mansur al-Halaj when he was being crucified. Yeah. He was being, you know, uh, he was uh, guilty of shatiya, what is it, theopathic, um, uh, blas- blasphemous theopathic utterance, I think, is how Anne-Marie Shamel translates as shatiya. Hmm. And as he was being... An al-Haq, by saying... No, no, right. An al-Haq, yeah, yeah, no. An al-Haq. Yeah, yeah and as he, as he was being marched right. to his crucifixion, mm-hmm. he was saying, uqtuluni ya thiqati fi inna qatli hayati. You know, kill me, all my friends, in my death is my life. And then as he was being tied to the gibbet, he said, Wow. This is related by Imam al-Ghazali. They did not kill him nor crucify him, but it was made to appear so unto them. So what does he mean by that? In other words, you can kill my jasad. And this is what Abu Hatim al-Razi, who is an Ismaili scholar, the way he sort of deals with this is they can kill the nasut or the human uh, side of Christ. But they cannot touch his khulud or his eternal or Im- immortal aspect. Yeah. And he calls it lahut, but Ismaili theology is, is, a, bit, um, uh, is, a, is a bit problematic okay. for the Sunnis. Mm-hmm. So uh, Ismaili theology sounds kind of like Nestorianism, uh, which was uh, condemned at the Council of Ephesus in 431 of the Common Era. So Nestorius was a bishop who said that he didn't believe in hypostatic union. In other words, that Jesus was really two separate persons. He was the divine son, and he was the human Christ. And uh, so who was killed on the cross? It was only the, div- it was only the human Christ. Uh, and that's considered to be blasphemy, according to uh, Trinitarians today, because Jesus has to die as God in order, th- in, in order for there to be um, vicarious atonement of all of humanity. That's right. Hmm. So it seems like, and some some Western scholars have uh, have espoused that the origins of Ismaili Christology really come from uh, uh, Nestorianism. Uh, but um, I think what Ghazali is saying is a little bit different. He's not saying there's a lahut or divine or deity aspect to Christ. Hmm. He's saying the spirit of his message cannot be killed by them. Mm. So somebody might say, well, that seems a little myst- uh, mystical and it's very esoteric. But if you read the Quran, you know, falam uh, There's a verse in the Quran, you know, after the Battle of Badr, you did not kill them; mm. that God killed them, right? So in reality, so it seems like you killed them or you s- you slew them on the battlefield. But in reality, that was according to the well pleasing will of God. And in fact, God literally did that because God, God is a doer of everything. Right. You did not throw those pebbles when you threw. God threw them. So they didn't really kill the Messiah. In other words, you know, that's what it seemed like on the surface. But in reality, for some reason, this is what God intended for the Messiah. Now the question becomes, why would God intend that for the Messiah? Well, the Christians have an answer. That's right. It's been, this is where we get into soteriology, you know, like um, the study of salvation. Of course, the Christians will say because he died for your sins. But um, I think Mahmoud Ayyub uh, has something interesting to say here. So he says that there's definitely no vicarious atonement in Islam, but there is something called redemptive suffering. And redemptive suffering has sort of two forms. There is redemptive intercession or direct intercession 
and there's also a direct exemplar. That, in other words, Jesus is really setting an example of self-sacrifice for others to emulate mm -hmm. by doing that. Another way to look <coughs> at it is uh, that uh, Jesus was sort of sacrificing himself to save his nation to sort of stave off the invasion of the, or the, the punishment of the Roman Empire. Uh, Caiaphas, actually, the high priest um, of the Sanhedrin, makes some comment in the Gospel of John, it is expedient for one man to die in order for the nation to be saved. In other words, we have to placate the Romans right. and, and kill somebody that is being highly touted as our king mm -hmm. in order for them to sort of um, not, basically not attack our entire nation. So in that sense, the death of Jesus sort of pushes back um, divine wrath upon Israel. And then about 40 years later or so, which was pretty much equivalent to the time of the Israelite wandering uh, in the wilderness, uh, the temple was finally destroyed. Mm. So there was sort of a stay of execution, if you will, for Israel. The disciples had 40 years to go out and preach the gospel. And then finally, when it was almost universally rejected by Bani Israel, then the wrath came. And this is what early... Christians like Origen and others would say happened. Um, this is how they sort of interpret the punishment or the destruction of the temple, which today is actually politically incorrect to say. Mm. To say, for example, the Temple of Solomon was destroyed by the Romans in 70, the Common Era, because, because the Jews rejected their Messiah is totally politically incorrect to say. Mm. Mm. It, was an, it was actually after Vatican II in the 1960s, the 21st Ecumenical Council, when uh, the Mosaic Covenant was reinstituted by the Catholic Church. Right. And, and the Pope uh, recently, um, whether it was this Pope or the last Pope, I think it was this current Pope Francis, who made a comment that we don't evangelize Jews anymore. They don't even need Jesus anymore because they have their covenant, which is very interesting because Muslims who believe in Christ as the Messiah, uh -huh. as a prophet, they believe in the virgin birth, you can even deal with the crucifixion in ways that affirms that they need the gospel. But, mm. but Jews who don't, who don't even believe in Jesus, um, huh. uh, who have no belief about Jesus, um, they don't need the gospel because mm. it's not politically correct. When you say not politically correct, is it because it, it lends into these notions of like the blood libel or whatever with Jews, yeah. I mean, right? Yeah. That they, that they, that they killed Yeah, and Jesus some Muslims, and yeah, like Maududi, I, I, I don't think, well, who was it? Uh, there's a Catholic, there's actually a Catholic Islamicist named Giulio Bassetti Sani uh -huh. who interprets that ayah, he says, yeah, they, the Jews didn't kill or crucify him, it was the Romans, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, I don't, I don't know about that. I mean, if you read the New Testament, that's like saying if a man kills another man, that man didn't do it, the gun did it, <coughs> right? I mean, certainly uh, the, the Romans, um, they crucified Jesus at the behest of the Jewish crowds. Now, what's, what's very important to make, the point to make, is that Jews today have absolutely nothing to do with, obviously, and, and it's, it's sad we have to make this point, yeah. they have absolutely nothing to do with the blood of Jesus. Right. So this idea that, because you know, Caiaphas, uh, according to Matthew, um, you know, Pilate sort of washes his hands of the blood and says, you know, if you want to crucify him, you see to it. And then Caiaphas, the high priest, he says, may his blood be upon us and our children after us. Mm -hmm. And this is the verse that's used by Christians all throughout Christendom um, to um, advocate this idea of sort of transgenerational blood guilt. Yeah. That all the Jews are necessary for the death of Jesus. Now, now Pilate is uh, uh, Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate, the Roman he's governor. He's the second magistrate that, that, that Jesus has brought before, or the, isn't there like two that he's taken to? And then finally, neither of them want to sort of give the yeah. execution order and, and well yeah he was the roman governor yeah. of judea okay so okay. so actually the the and this was a small group of of pharisees in the sanhedrin the vast majority of i mean jesus is jewish his disciples are jewish yeah. mary is, Talk is about jewish. pharisees though for a second because i think yeah. that's another i think what well, was a question i had for you right because no. the pharisees are what jewish literalist yeah, I mean they're they're considered a religious authority. The, okay, the ulama and many of them right. were corrupt and yeah, uh, yeah. And and one of the reforms that that that, that Jesus uh, advocates is uh -huh. a reform of these uh, of of the Pharisees. He does. I mean, right. he, he's certainly butting heads with them right all throughout the gospel, especially in Matthew, the seven woes of Matthew mm -hmm. twenty. Woe unto you, scribes. So what he's trying to do, he's yeah. not necessarily attacking them doctrinally okay. or theologically, right? Uh, but 
he is um, uh, attacking them as far as um, their their morality, their character. Okay. So he says, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. Yeah. How can you escape the punishment of hell? You strain at the gnat and swallow the camel. Yeah. You, you're like whited sepulchers on the outside. You are clean on the inside. They reek of death, mm. right? Calling out their hypocrisy. Mm. Um, uh, so he's constantly butting heads with them. Now, there, there were actually Pharisees who were, the, the Gospels describe as secret disciples of Jesus. Mm. Joseph of Arimathea. Mm. You have Nicodemus as well, who meets with Jesus in John chapter 3. What's really interesting is in the 19th century, um, there was a theory that gained a lot of popularity about what actually happened uh, during the crucifixion. Okay. And it's called the swoon hypothesis or the swoon theory. Uh, in, in confessional circles, I think it was... I think it started with the founder of the Ahmadiyya movement, um, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad. Uh, in Sunni circles, um, uh, the founder of Aligarh University, Sayyid Ahmad Khan, he explicitly subscribes to the swoon theory. Okay. Swoon theory is basically that Jesus survived the crucifixion, right? Um, and then goes off to like India? Well, that's the Ahmadiyya. The Ahmadiyya okay. say that, yeah, he survived the crucifixion and then he, yeah. he died an old man in Kashmir, Kashmir, and to this day in a city called Srinagar, I think, there's a tomb of Jesus where thousands make pilgrimage to. Really? Yeah. Mm. So this idea actually gained acceptance in Western academic circles as well during this time. This was, you know, the tail end of the Enlightenment. People okay. have this sort of rationalist sort of way of reading yeah. the Bible now and what actually happened and how do we detangle the mythical Jesus from the historical Jesus, and you have Albert Schweitzer's quest for this oracle Jesus. So there was a German scholar of the Bible named uh, Karl Friedrich Barth. There's not Karl Barth, is it? that's a different one. Karl Friedrich Barth. And he had a very interesting take on the swoon theory. So he says here that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, this, you know, the secret disciples of Jesus, they weren't actually Pharisees. They were Essenes, which was a sort of monastic, like male-only secret society as he describes them, <coughs> and Jesus was also from the Essenes, and Bart was a was a you know high degree Freemason, by the way. Um, so he's into the secret society type of thing. Yeah. Anyway, so he says it sounds that, very Da Vinci Code. Exactly. <laughs> so according, according to him, he says that he says that um, that the it, the whole thing was a conspiracy. Yeah. In order to sort of get rid of this idea in the Jewish mindset of a militaristic Messiah. So they, they basically, Jesus and these two disciples, they had this plot that they were going to fake his death, he was, and Jesus was going to sort of uh, bow his head as a sort of ruse to let them know, okay, now I'm, I'm, I'm claiming to be dead. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the, the Roman centurion didn't break his legs because they paid him off, you know. And then, uh, and then you know, they took him down from the cross very quickly, and they, they took him to the garden tomb. They resuscitated him with healing herbs, and three days later, he was able to walk, and presto, a resurrected Messiah, mm. right? Um, so that, that's his sort of take on what happened. Now, modern Muslim apologists, they, they subscribe to this theory uh, without the whole conspiracy aspect. So like Ahmed Didat, Zakir Naik, um, Shabir Ali in Toronto, all of them have espoused some form of the swoon theory. Mm. Mm. Wow. That, that Jesus uh, was put on the cross, uh, but he didn't die. And then, inni mutawafika, they take that to mean, yeah, that his soul was taken, but he was asleep, and then it was returned to him, anything to avoid dying, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then they use certain things like, um, like Jesus and Luke and John appears to be in disguise. You know, why would he disguise himself? if he's the resurrected Christ, and obviously he's afraid of being spotted by Pharisees or by Roman authorities and, and, and killed again, this time for sure. And so they, they have certain arguments they use for the, for the swoon theory. Okay. Um, this is, I mean, this is fascinating to me in the sense that <coughs> it draws to mind the way today you have people uh, looking at the Kennedy assassination and yeah. coming up with yeah. these very elaborate sort of scenarios. And yeah, uh, I mean, it... it f like that this feels inherently unknowable yeah and the the question i have or the thought that i have i'd love for you i mean do you do you think the fact that there is barely any mention of it in the quran there's no mention of it in the hadith, is that not itself full of meaning yeah yeah i mean that's a good point i mean there, there's nothing there's nothing inconceivable about 
a prophet being killed. That's right. You know, um, and this is why some of the uh, some of the ulama played with this idea that the Christian narrative is correct, mm. uh, but they didn't kill him in reality, right? That this was God was in control, and this is what God destined for the Messiah. Um, so, I mean, w- it, it, it feels almost like we're focusing on the wrong thing. Yeah, you know, a lot of times Muslims, they sort of, <laughs> this is, I'm obviously very, I'm generalizing highly, <laughs> but uh, there's, there's a sort of tendency amongst Muslim scholarship to want to be divisive for some reason. That's right. Mm. So um, you'll have scholars that insist that it was Ishmael to be sacrificed, Ishmael, Ishmael, and I think they know better. Because right. there were big Sahaba. I mean, Ibn That's Mas'ud, right. I've heard Ibn Sayyidina Ali, because the son isn't named in the text of the Quran. Mm-hmm. It's left ambiguous yes. for a reason. Right. You know, so, I mean, one of my teachers, um, he was doing a radio show, and some, a Muslim called in because he took the position that it was Isaac mm-hmm. to be sacrificed. Yes. And then somebody called in and, and like, threatened to, like, beat him or something like that. And right. To That's kill so him. Strange, and, you know? yeah. yeah, and he just said, you know, there's a difference of opinion about that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, on the, on the issue of the Christians, I mean, I used to debate Christians all the time. I, I used to, you know, uh, have theories on, you know, Christ was, was, he was substituted for who was it? And I, oh, it was probably Barabbas. And I mean, that's, that's I think that's um, Mo Duty's position, or he certain, certainly makes that, uh, he sort of plays with that idea that this man Barabbas was crucified instead of Christ. Um, or Simon of Cyrene uh, was crucified instead of Christ. And it wasn't I'll Judah like the one who betrays, like the disciple that betrays him. Was uh, that is that an opinion as that's well? That's an opinion, oh, okay. yeah. Okay. And that's and that's yeah. um, that, that's men- that's actually widely mentioned. Uh, right. That's uh, Sayyid Qutb also takes that yeah. from the the Gospel. Of, I mean, the Gospel of Barnabas says that. Okay. Right. Uh, oh, no, okay. Yeah, and um, there are some Western scholars that would say that you know Judas is, is an interesting name. Yehuda, the Jew, right? The Jew was killed and. So they would huh. see that as an unhistorical yeah. sort of anti-Semitic yeah. slight. Uh, um, yeah. Allahu alam. Yeah. The, the point is, we don't really know. Right. The verse is ambiguous. Walakin shubi alahum is 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 very enigmatic. That's right. It's, it's a multi-vocal verse. Right. It's inherently uh, yeah. ambiguous. And by, and by design. And by, I mean, by, it, by design. Right. Yeah. So well, that, that in and of Because I always is, say, yeah. you know, one of the one of the points I make in this context is that, um, you know. On the other side, on the other hand, when the Quran deals with, for example, Trinitarianism, yeah. it deals with it very categorically, yeah. like, and it deals with it time and time again. There's multiple places in the Quran that God condemns yeah. this idea of a triune God right. or Trinitarianism. Yeah. However, with this seemingly um, major element of Christianity, such as yeah. the crucifixion, it, it's it's dealt with in a very referential and truncated fashion. One yeah. verse, which itself is um, uh, you know, uh, enigmatic in it terms is. of its interpretation. Yeah. So one way that again, and in, in please, I would want, I would love your opinion on this. Is that mm. to me, it's not the who, what, where, when with regards to the crucifixion. It's rather the meaning that we take from it. Right. Mm. For Christian, for 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 for, for Christians, the the crucifixion itself, the events of the crucifixion are probably less important than. What does the crucifixion mean? Yeah. It's it's Christ dying for the sins of humanity, or yeah. God sacrificing His only Son. I mean, huh. right? I mean, yeah. those are those are more important issues that right. we have to contest with theologically, exactly. rather than the who, what, when, where, exactly. how. Exactly, it's right. the significance of the crucifixion. That's exactly. right. Exactly. That's right. And I don't think you can square vicarious atonement with the Quran at all. And That's I, right. Uh, yeah, or Trinitarian orthodoxy. And so, to me, that the, like what you said, vicarious atonement, that mm. becomes the crux of the issue. That's what the it is. The nature of sin, the nature of salvation. These are the, these are the sort of meta issues that are yeah. being, that are being discussed here. Right. Rather than again. The who, what, yeah. When, I mean, if how. you if you read the New Testament, uh, I mean, Luke chapter fifteen. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is Luke's travel narrative. I mean, Jesus gives a beautiful parable, uh, the prodigal son. You might yes. have heard that yeah. expression, "My prodigal son re- to the prodigal son returns." Basically, this man had two sons. One stayed with him. The other went out and was a spendthrift. He was a musrif. He was a sinner. And then after some years, uh, he comes back and he sees his father at a distance, and his father greets him with open arms. And that's the end of the pericope. I mean, what, what is Jesus teaching here? Is he teaching vicarious blood atonement? Mm. Or is he teaching 
Toba. Right. It's teaching Toba. Hmm. You know, so that's the son that repents and returns. Exactly. Yeah. That's what it is. Right. Teshuva in Hebrew is from the same root as Toba. Toba. And it's it's it, that's clearly the teaching of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. um, in Ezekiel, for example, uh, that uh, you know, the, if the wicked would turn from his wickedness and do that which is lawful and right, turn right, taba yetubu, turn from his wickedness, reorient himself towards God, make toba, then he shall surely live spiritually. Mm -hmm. So this is Musaddiq Ali Mabain Yadim in Torah, Isa alayhi salam. He confirms these salient aspects of Jewish theology. Mm. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, this whole idea of, of uh, you know, a, their belief is essentially God gave his own life, hmm. you know, so. Well, I, I, I'd really like to talk about that because yeah. I think this also lends itself into a conversation around um, Trinitarianism. Yeah. Because mm. I think Muslims inherently, well, I would argue, don't understand it um, yeah. and, are, and, and, and you can, you know, um, you can polemicize it without truly understanding something. Yeah. And so I think that's kind of been the Muslim response to Trinitarianism. Like, how can you make three is one, one is three, and you've got the whole, yeah. uh, like, sort of Ahmadidat <laughs> the, kind the of... bullet point. Yeah, yeah. You know? And so how do Christians uh -huh. make sense of yeah. Trinity or Trinitarianism yet still believe or say that they are monotheistic? Huh. Yeah. So the short answer yeah. is that... <laughs> they would say that God is one essence, hmm. right? Okay. But that this essence is manifested uh, in three distinct persons, hmm. right? So the Greek terms, one usia, one essence, one substance, but three hypostases. Um, so, I mean, explaining the Trinity is, is, is nearly impossible. I think it's Augustine of Hippo, who actually wrote in his book, De Trinitate, on the Trinity, mm -hmm. said, you know, I, I doubt very seriously that most people will be able to understand what I'm saying here. Um, so, uh, you know, understanding the reality of the Trinity, I think, is, is impossible. Uh, but uh, understanding, how, you know, what, what is being said and what the claims are, you mm -hmm. know, the sort of doctrine of the Trinity rather than its reality, I think we can grasp it. Um, uh, albeit it might be somewhat contradictory in our minds. Um, so when we're dealing with the realm of metaphysics, with the realm of, of transcendence, it's hard for us to sort of grapple with that, right? So uh, as far as the relationship of, of the Son of God to God the Father, the Christian Trinitarian would say, that although the Father caused the Son, and they use those words, the Father caused the Son, mm -hmm. there was no time when the Father existed that the Son did not. So this mm. was done in pre-eternality, right? So the Father does not have temporal precedence over the Son. And since the Son was caused from the usia, as, uh, as Athanasius says, from the very essence of God, then the, then, then the Father also does not have ontological precedence over the Son. Now, you would say, well, I mean, if something is the effect of something else, if, something is, if, the, yeah. if there's an effect of a cause, right. then it would seem axiomatic that the effect is ontologically inferior to its cause, and that's the Neoplatonic position, actually. But the Christian will retort here and say, no, it doesn't mean that at all, because the Son is actually produced or generated from the very essence of the Father. Okay. So they are absol absolutely ontologically equal. Mm. And then we get to the Holy Spirit, which is the same type of thing. They don't, they don't like to use the word. I mean, they say the Holy Spirit is caused by the Father as well, but the Son is begotten while the Spirit proceeds eternally from the Father. Um, <coughs> so they would say that this is sort of, uh, you know, Trinitarianism or, Trinitarian monotheism. They say, look, it's monotheism because it's one essence, it's one God, right? Um, however, this God is manifested into three persons. Now, what is a person? According to Trinitarian theologians, a person is a collection of unique attributes. That's what a person is. Okay. So the Father has a unique attribute of being the cause. The Holy Spirit has a unique attribute of being eternally proceeding. And the Son has a unique attribute of being begotten, which is another way of saying he's also caused. Um, so uh, 
that sounds very strange. It, it sounds contradictory. I mean, how, you know, a, the whole idea of a pre-eternal sun by itself seems a bit oxymoronic, mm-hmm. that you have a sun, by definition, who is generated from something else, yet he's also pre-eternal, right? Um, but again, the, the Christian response here is when you're dealing with the realm of metaphysics and transcendence, right. um, it's, it's logical theologically, but might be illogical. Um, rationally. Rationally, or, yeah. Right. Um, but the real issue, then, is the incarnation, you mm. know? Um, I mean, it's interesting, the Mu'tazila, they would say similar things about the Sunnis. They would say that we have sort of, we're sort of Christianizing our concept of kalam, because we would say that the attribute of God, right? I mean, the Christians say the sun is a collection of unique attributes. Yeah. The attribute of kalam, um, the Sunnis would say, is pre-eternal, uncreated, and then the Mu'tazila would say, well, that's what the Christians are saying yeah. about the Son of God. I think the difference, however, is that the Christians would say that the Son in and of himself is fully God, He's not a part of God. He's not a third of God, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Whereas kalam, although it is not the essence nor anything other than the essence, surely surely it is not God in and of itself. It gives an additional meaning to the essence of God. So there is a similarity to a point, but then the similarity (coughs) sort of breaks down or the analogy breaks down. Um, But the incarnation is really the, I think... um, So in other words, I think if we're dealing with the realm of transcendence, I think a, a clever Trinitarian theologian would be able to um, somewhat convince people that this is monotheism mm-hmm. and that this is what it really means for a person of God. It's a collection of un- unique attributes, and it's really just one God. It's one essence that's sort of causing these collections of attributes to come, even though they're pre-eternal. Um, so there's a way of sort of dealing with that. I don't agree with it, but there, but the real issue I think for us with, and, and for Jewish theologians is the incarnation that that the second person, the Trinity, uh, incarnated, um, in, in other words, became or assumed flesh. Mm-hmm. Right now, does all of this get, if you pardon the expression, flushed out um, some 300 years? Is it true that it all gets sort of flushed out, you know, in the Council of Ni- uh, Nicaea in 325? Yeah, so the Council of Nicaea was Nicaea. Yeah, 325, first mm-hmm. ecumenical council. This is when um, the Son of God became officially God the Son. Okay. So um, it was called for by Constantine. There was 318 bishops, um, and uh, the main issue at that time was the Arian controversy, right? So there was a presbyter in the church in Alexandria who was basically um, saying that the Son of God is an honorific title, it just means he's the Messiah or he's the first of creation. Mm. Um, the, the Father is a monarch. He's the only one who is God. He is the, the um, sufficient cause of all things, including the Son, which makes him ontologically superior to the Son. So he was espousing a type of um, unitarian monotheism, um, whereas Athanasius, his theological opponent, also his teacher, um, was espousing a type of Trinitarian monotheism. And in, at Nicaea, yeah. the latter did win the day by vote uh, and became sort of the official position um, of the Catholic Church at the time. And mentioned, I think I mentioned this last time as well, Henry Chadwick says in his book, The Early Church, that despite the Council of Nicaea, the vast majority of bishops in that region continued to teach Arian Christology, that the Father and Son are not homoousios, they're not the same essence, but they're rather homoi or even heterousios, meaning they, they have similar essence or they're completely different. Okay. So it's interesting, um, the aftermath of Nicaea. And then 381 is the next ecumenical council where the Holy Spirit was also officially recognized as the third person of the Trinity, pre-eternal, co-substantial. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And then what about, the, like, is it the Council of Nicaea then where the idea of the Eucharist and, 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 and uh, uh, that doctrine sort of comes into play? Um, I'm not sure about, I mean, the, the doctrine of, the, the, well, the Eucharist as a sacrament has origins in the New Testament. Okay. Certainly proto-Orthodox church fathers, um, in other words, uh, pre-Nicene oh. church fathers, they would interpret those those scripture verses. Right, take of my flesh and yeah, right, right, yeah. things like that. Okay, Exactly. And yeah. the Catholics believe in a process, transubstantiation, yes. in, which, um, in which the bread and the wine are literally transformed in their essence right. to the flesh and blood of Jesus. Mm-hmm. 
although the accidents remain the same. So it still looks like bread and smells like bread and tastes like bread and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Protestants will take that more symbolic. Mm. They don't believe it's an actual uh, transformation into the literal blood and, mm. and flesh of Christ. Um, but yeah, I mean, we are talking about the blood, the blood libel earlier in the show. Yeah. I mean, uh, the Christians in, in uh, you know, because once in a while somebody would, somebody would stumble across descriptions of Jesus in the Talmud, and this would start, you know, sort of spark this massive sort of pogrom against uh, Jewish communities in, 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 in Christendom, in, yeah. in Christian Europe. Right. Um, and then they started this rumor that, you know, rabbis would sneak into churches and they would take the leftover bread and they would go back to the synagogue and nail it to a cross. Bec and it's literally the flesh of Jesus yeah. that they're crucifying over again. And you'll see <laughs> paintings depicting this. Right. Um, what is it called? Uh, the desecration of the host. That's what the official, hmm. you know. Uh, wow. Which is very interesting, you know, yeah. the, you know, that Jews throughout the Middle Ages would seek refuge in Muslim-majority countries That's right. under Sharia law. <laughs> You know, because they were given auto they were given autonomous rule according to their own courts mm -hmm. to practice halakha law. Yeah, you know, yeah. which is very interesting. Uh, well, I, I <coughs> it's it's interesting that you made that point about about the Jews living in Muslim lands because one of the I mean before we sort of conclude, I I, I did want to talk about or move the conversation from you know um, Christology or or, or 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 Jesus alone into more of a broader conversation about mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, Ahl al-Kitab or Jews and Christians. Mm -hmm. One of the arguments, and again, this is probably related to the kind of politici uh, politicized conversations that we have around these things, mm -hmm. um, is that one of the arguments that you hear as well, when the Quran talks about Ahl al-Kitab or people of the book or people of scripture, it, it, that is a historical term, and it is not a um, a universal term that can be applicable at all times and all all, all places. Mm. What would be your response to that? Well, I, I would say that's generally not the sort of understanding of the early ulama. That's right. I mean, um, initially, Ahl al-Kitab, the, Mus the Muslims took kitab to mean Bible because uh, Bible in Greek means book. Um, now, um, when the Islamic uh, Empire, we get biblio from right, right, right yeah, exactly, right. Bi yeah, biblioteca, from yeah. the place of, <laughs> yeah. So, tabiblion in Greek means the book, mm. al kitabul muqaddas in Arabic, the Holy Bible, the Holy Book. Now, as the Islamic Empire was expanding, Muslims came to realize there are a lot more religions in the world than just Judaism and Christianity. I mean, Judaism is very, very small. That's right. So what do we do with all these Hindus and Buddhists? And Zoroastrians. Zoroastrians. Yeah. So the ulama, they, because this is ijtihad, mm -hmm. you know, they, they would extend the title Ahl al-Kitab to any religion mm -hmm. that, that professed faith in, in, in some scripture, mm -hmm. no matter what that scripture was, right. you know. So the term is, I mean, this, and this is something that's important, you know, that's, um, that, we, that we have to recognize that uh, we need to grow and we need to, to be open to different interpretations. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's certain parameters that we do not exceed, right? You know, sort of, you know, hudud or humanitical parameters. Right. But I always argue that you can sort of stretch those borders a little bit sometimes and I call it thinking outside the box within the box, right? <laughs> like this whole idea of crucifixion. Yeah. I mean, I've been to places where um, I would ask a scholar, a very learned scholar, is it okay for us to believe that Jesus was put anywhere near a cross? And you say, no, this is kufur, and you can't, yeah. you, how dare you? You're imitating the kufar. And, and, you know, I mean, that's just one example. It is. You know, so right. so I think we need to be open-minded to, to, to Oh, I, I, I think our... Uh, if you will, I think you mentioned this last time, but you know, I think the Muslims have been largely anemic when it comes to comparative theology. Yeah. Um, and then, which is why I think having someone like you on the show is fascinating because I mean, I think you mm -hmm. represent, if, if you would, if you would pardon me saying this to you in your face is you sort of rep one of a kind in terms of the, a, 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 a real m scholar of both biblical languages and the Quran and can really, you know, negotiate these conversations in a very nuanced and learned fashion as opposed mm. to knee-jerk or politicized or polemic. Hysterical. Um, <laughs> hysterical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
and and w- what was comparative theology? I'm, I'm, um, al bidal wal nahl or something, right? Al milal wal nihal. Yeah, yeah. Milal, so nations yeah. increase. I mean, we started. Milal, right, right. Milal, al milal wal nihal. Milal wal nihal. Yeah, I mean, Muslim theologians. They, they're the pioneers of this discipline. Hmm. Abu Rayhan al Biruni, mm-hmm. Imam al Shahristani, even, even Imam al Ghazali. I mean, right. the Wadi'ah, the, the founder, is recognized. Imam al Shahristani, Kitab al Mila Nihal, the Book of Nations and Creeds. So this, this is getting back to our, our roots. What, huh. is, what is Islam essentially? Is, is a restoration. Uh, it is a, because people say, you know, you, you need a reformation, an Islamic reformation. Islam is in and of itself essentially a reformation of Judaism and Christianity. Mm. Mm. And that's why it's so important uh, when we read the Quran to understand its subtext. And I can't stress this enough, that mm-hmm. the Quran is engaging with Jewish and Christian and pagan and other texts. I mean, the Quran is making mention of, you know, and uh, there's another example of, um, you know, Dur you know, the, the one with two horns and you know, I was in a, I was teaching a class on tafsir one time, a ba- basic tafsir Muhammad Suyuti, mm. and uh, and I mentioned Dur Qurnain is probably Alexander of of of, uh, of Macedon, and a Muslim brother in the in the audience, and he just he just kind of lost his mind. How dare you say that? And, why? You know, because who's Alexander? He's you know he's mm. probably a pagan, and mm. why would Allah praise this man? And huh. and. You know, it's just uh, Imam Suyuti actually says Ismahu Iskandar. His That's name right. is Alexander, and you know, according to Sirah, uh, the the Jews um, they they told Abu Sufyan ibn Harb to ask the Prophet sallallahu about this person Dur Qarnain, because they had something in their possession where they could check his answer, or mm. else what's the purpose of the question? Huh. Wow. So there's a document in late antiquity called the Legend of Alexander, where it details his three journeys, and and so the, the answer that the Prophet sallallahu gave uh, agrees with this document that was in possession of the Jews in Yathrib at the time. So they can they can check his answer, or else <laughs> what's the purpose of the question? You know, just tell us about Dur yeah. Um but So right. the the idea that one would get so perturbed by that that's sort of yeah. fascinating it's to a me. type of triumphalism i might even say supremacy, supremacy. Huh. you know yeah. and we have to keep it i mean alexander the great he was a student of aristotle you can establish his monotheism if you wanted to mm-hmm. you know yeah. if you if that really means a lot to you um you probably can i mean he was a student of aristotle he was a very virtuous man but that's probably him you know who's who's um luqman al-hakim I yeah mean, there's something attributed ibn abbas that he was an abyssinian sage right. But if you if you read you know what those sections in, in Surah Luqman about, right. about his son, I mean he's he's all about pedagogy, he's about education. Right. He sounds like Confucius. Right. <laughs> so you have you have the Hellenistic world, you have right. you know the, the the far Eastern wisdom. Uh, Imam Shaharistani says that Khidr is probably the Buddha. So I was going to say, I mean, very <laughs> so similar, you, right, to, yeah. to Khidr in the sense that these are figures. Who espouse great wisdom, right? In, in this, and to, to to the extent that it's preserved in the Quran, yeah. yet they are not prophets. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and speaking of prophets, I mean, I think we'd be remiss not to mention this on the show. Um, the the opinion of you know, you know scholars like Ibn Hazm and I believe uh, uh, um, Al Qurtubi that yeah. Mary, yeah, right, the yeah. the mother of Jesus, they uh, insist on it. They insist, okay. She's a prophet. Right. And also, Um, um Musa, wa uh, awhayna uh, ila Ummi Musa, that she received the type of wahi, and that, wa qalat al malaikatu ya Maryamu. Right. Right? So they, they would insist that they're definitely female prophets. I mean, it's a minority opinion, but it's a strong opinion. Right. Mm. You know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I mean, this is an opinion that, that we should we should highlight. That's right. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, 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 it's part of our scholarship to do that. You know, but um, anyway, so yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, it's interesting because if you read the Quran. <coughs> Zakaria alayhi salam is definitely a prophet. Mm-hmm. He's a he's the Kohen of the temple. So he's a high priest. Mm-hmm. He's an old man. He has a wisdom of age. And he was taught a lesson by a 12 year old girl, Maryam alayhi salam. <laughs> he stopped making dua for her son because he thought, well, it's not it's not possible. I'm too old. My wife's too old. And hmm. And then he saw fruit out of season. And here's something else. I mean, fruit out of, where does that come from? That's mentioned in the proto-gospel of James. The Quran is, is, seems to be uh, interfacing intertextually with this 
um, gospel that's actually outside the Christian canon. The reason why it's outside the Christian canon is because it has very little to say about Jesus. Mm. It's about Mary. So the, the Christian fathers, they thought, well, we're not going to put this into the canon because it doesn't say much about, about Jesus. Um, but it, this seems to be the sort of uh, um, the intertextual sort of uh, touchstone of, of, this, of this episode in the Quran, mm -hmm. that there was risk. What is that risk fruit out of season that was next to her? And then Zakaria alayhi salam, who is a prophet and a Kohen and a, and a sheikh, and he suddenly turned to Allah to make dua, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately gave him news of Yahya alayhi salam. You know. That's right. And the other thing you just reminded me of going back to the crucifixion narrative. Yeah. And, you know, there's a verse in the Quran, So, you know, the, the sort of, one time a, another a scholar said to me, there, there's, no, there's, no, there's no mention of the death or resurrection of Jesus anywhere in the Quran. <laughs> and I said, are you serious? And I quoted this verse to him, Jesus speaking in the first person. Yes. Where he said, and peace be upon me the day that I was born, the day that I die, and the day that I'm resurrected. And he said, oh, that's talking about the end of time, mm -hmm. that Jesus towards the end of time. And, and it's, you know, 18 verses earlier, it says the same thing about John the Baptist. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know if that really works for me, <laughs> you know, because, you know, why, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala single out these two men and talk about their birth, their death, and their resurrection when it's going to happen to everybody? Hmm. So, what's, so, what's interesting, I, so what's interesting also is here I, I think the, the Quran is, is, is affirming mm -hmm. uh, the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. And you say, what about John the Baptist? Well, if you read the New Testament and you read the subtext of it, uh, there was a rumor that John the Baptist had also been resurrected. And I think the Quran is affirming that. I mean, when Herod, Herod executed John the Baptist, according to the New Testament, the Gospel of Mark, and... Uh, and when he heard about Jesus, his immediate reaction was, that's John resurrected. Why would he think that? It's because probably he heard a rumor that John had been resurrected. And Jesus asked his disciples in the Gospel of Mark, who do people say I am? Mm -hmm. And they say to him, uh, they say, John the Baptist or Elijah or one of the prophets. Well, they knew that John had been, uh, had been killed, had been assassinated by Herod. So what they mean to say is a resurrected John the Baptist. So I think these two men are singled out here. Uh, because um, because they sort of mirror each other. Mm -hmm. Their births were miraculous. Um, they were vehemently opposed by their enemies, might have been killed by their enemies, both of them, and they were both resurrected according to the, the text. Mm. Why would these two men be singled out by the Quran if you know everyone's going to be resurrected at the general resurrection at the end of time? There's something special about them. Mm. You, know? mm. you, you, you also reminded me of, of, of the fact that you know, um, many of the prophets that, that are mentioned, or, or many of the great prophets uh, that Muslims believe in, um, th there's sort of a missing father figure. And I yeah. wonder if there's any significance there. Yeah, that's true. I mean, if you look at the Ulul Azm in Rusul, yes. uh, at least four of them didn't have their biological fathers in right. their lives. Right. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he took the responsibility of raising them. This is called the Tarbiya Rabbaniya. Mm. They had a lordly upbringing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the word Rabb obviously means someone who takes care of you in stages. Mm. And right. I've heard you in another context talk about when the, when, 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 when the, uh, new, when the new Testament talks about the father, yeah, it's 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 it's, it's not the ab can be interchangeable with the rab. That's what that's what it means. Oh, that's okay. what. Yeah, it's exactly. Yeah. I mean, if you, I mean, in the in the book of Isaiah, uh, there's a prayer that says, "Ata um, Adonai Avinu, you are the Lord our Father." Mm -hmm. Now, if you read any rabbinical exegesis of that, it'll say the meaning of that is Lord and cherisher and sustainer and father figure, and it's metaphorical and. And this is how Jesus actually uses the term in the New Testament. On the Sermon on the Mount, they ask him, how do we pray? And mm -hmm. Jesus says in Syriac, Avun devashmeo, nedqata shmoch, our Father who art in heaven. Yeah. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name, right. yeah. So, because again, you, you, we, we, we've talked about the sort of hy hysterical responses that you see among Muslims. Like, yeah. you know, any idea of, of, of like the Lord's Prayer or anything yeah. like that is being... You know, it's beautiful, cool. yeah, yeah, is is heretical. Like, yeah. how dare you say the Father? Because as if you're yeah. equating, you know, that that you automatically are prescribing to a triune yeah. God or Trinity. You know, you know what's funny is yeah. I'm 
as we're having this conversation, I'm reminded of, you know, when I was living in Saudi Arabia when I was a kid, mm. we went to an Arabic school, and um, uh, somebody had a pen in their pocket, like, mm. a clip over their pocket, so it kind of looked like that, and they said, no, no, don't do that, it looks, it looks like, like a cross. cross. <laughs> and, you know, I was uh, 11, maybe, yeah. and I'm thinking, like, really? Like, are this, is this what we're doing? You this know? will blow your mind, but, the, you know, um, uh, oh, wow. s- some who, 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 who sort of... Uh, um, People argue that you can't wear a tie uh, or a bow tie or, you know, yeah, like, yeah. like a tie because it's a cross. It's a cross. Yeah. See, I mean. You've never, <laughs> yeah, you've yeah, never heard I, that? I guess I'd, I've I've, that I've, I feel lucky for having not, not heard that. But, I mean, that just seems. It, my point is. Not that Zucky I'm, wears I'm a tie not, a lot. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen you in a tie. Uh, I think I wore one when I got married. <laughs> <laughs> I missed your wedding. Sorry. Um, okay. No, but I mean, I, I think, you know, not to impugn people's good intentions but it feels like it's it's kind of it's the same thing that we're, we're you know people in the muslim community are doing the same thing that uh you do when I, on the christian side when all their in their entire faith is bound up in in the crucifixion where it's like well mm-hmm. the, jesus was more than that you mm-hmm. know i mean i remember watching uh the the film you know uh, the passion of the christ and Oh, I, I, that, huh? I was I was horrified. <laughs> I mean, I was horrified. Yeah. By it. And I have I've had this conversation with Christian friends. I was like, yeah. I found it disrespectful, yeah. because d- to me, yeah, the, the idea that all, everything uh, that you're going to bind up Jesus into exactly. this depiction, as opposed to everything he was preaching for the entirety right. of his life, you know, yeah. and. It's a you ninety know, minute snuff film. I know so. you're a it, yeah exactly. I know you're a movie you're movie buff. When I was a kid um, in the eighties. On basic cable, they would play these beautiful Jesus movies, King of Kings, King of Kings. Sure. Jeffrey Hunter, Jeffrey Hunter. Uh, well, Jesus of Nazareth. Look at look at the film Ben Hur. Ben Hur is my favorite. Yeah. I think th- I think there's there's a scene in Ben Hur which I consider the most powerful scene in American film history, and it has nothing to do with the crucifixion. Is it the water? It's the water or, scene, right? It's yeah. incredible, and the way that they treat it with such reverence. They they never show his face. He yeah. never says a word. Right. Right. But you can just, in his actions... You see people re- 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 reacting to him. The Roman centurion just kind of forgot where he was for a yeah, minute because exactly. he's looking into the face of Christ. It's just an incredible scene. Um, but yeah, I mean, everything today is just, it's it's basically mm-hmm. violence porn. I mean, that's, yeah. that's the whole movie, The Passion of the Christ. It, I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's and, right. And it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's not even based on the Gospels. I'm familiar with the Gospels. Mel Gibson, I mean, it's, it's the Gospel according to Mel Gibson, basically. <laughs> I mean, he took a lot of that movie from the... Um, the visions of a Augustinian uh, nun named hmm. Anne Emmerich, who really? was a stigmatic, she would bleed and things like that. And she had these visions of uh, of things, and yeah, a lot of that movie's not based on the gospel. Hmm. I mean, just the, the carrying the cross. Three yeah. gospels say that for some reason it doesn't say why. They say the the Romans pulled a man out of the crowd, Simon of Cyrene, and he was compelled to bear the cross, and Jesus would sort of follow behind or in front. But in the movie, you know, he has both of them. Carrying, I mean, where, what gospel is that from? Mm. So you're combining gospels, you're creating your own gospel, mm. you know. Um, but, I mean, those are the movies when I was a kid. And, and, and I saw those movies, I mean, the, the, and they would even, the crucifixion scenes in those those classic movies, mm. it was done with, with, with respect, and it was, it was more classy. Uh, and uh, uh, I remember well, the first time I actually read the Quran when I was 19, I, I read that he was not crucified, or mm. he was not killed or crucified. And I remember initially I felt a type of relief, like, mm-hmm. okay, good, that didn't happen to him. But then there was tension, mm-hmm. like, what happened then? Yeah. And I became obsessed with, with what happened. But those movies were very powerful, and they don't make cinema like that anymore. <laughs> I mean, nowadays, what are the Christmas movies? Home Alone, which is a good movie, you know, but Elf. And then Die sure. Hard is a Christmas classic. Can you believe sure. that? Die Hard is a Christmas classic. Yippee-ki-yay, you know. And, 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 <laughs> and that... that is construed by some as a Christ metaphor. So, exactly. Yeah. Oh wow. Really? Yeah. Sure. I, well, as you said that, I'm picturing, you know, uh, uh, Bruce Willis jumping from the building, right? Is sure. Oh, yeah. There's the, the 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 bleeding from his. Oh, feet, the bleeding huh? from his feet. Oh, Stick I, mod- right. Wow. You know, I never thought. Wow. I never thought of that either. That, yeah. that is brilliant. <laughs> I gotta think about that one. Because I, I mean, like, I, I get Superman, right? We and yeah, we talked yeah. about this on the last show, actually, with Zachary, right? I mean, Superman, the Christ metaphor, and yeah. the Moses metaphor, right? Yeah. You know, parents putting him out um, uh, oh, to wow. to save him, but um, uh, we have run the gamut during this conversation. <laughs> we really have. Oh, well. uh, but <laughs> I wanted to say something, and because I think going back to this idea of like the the, the kind of responses you see among Muslims, I think what's interesting, and I think what 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 needs to be said is. 
you know, when 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 in our in our classical scholarship, when we were able to 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 to, to talk about these issues, I think w- w- what's often missed here is that it was from the vantage point of a a, a growing, robust civilizational power. Mm-hmm. And now, when we talk about these issues, we come at we approach them from a point of de- uh, like there's this defeatism, right? Yeah, we've succumbed to you yeah. know, our place in the world, or there's this very defeatist mentality. And so yeah. when, you, when, you, when you approach things from a defeatist mentality, there is the need to, to sort of, you know, like you said, like th- there's this sort of need to turn to supremacy and supremacy mm-hmm. kind of, uh, con- you know, uh, rhetoric because yeah. it makes you feel better. Right. Because you're, 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 you have an inferiority complex. Yeah, and I think that explains a lot of the polemicism yeah. that's happening, the, the popularity of... Uh, you know, um, sort of one-line sort of dawa um, Pamph- slogans. Pamphleteering. And pamphleteering. And, I mean, yeah. Pe- yeah, I mean, I used to be like that. Right. You yeah, know, I, I, I told the I'm story guilty. last, yeah, last time I was here. And, you know, it's just, um, you know, I think we need to improve our scholarship. Yeah. We need to engage in, in sacred languages. We need to study history. Um, I mean, I think it was Sayyidina Ali who said, you can learn anything. I mean, you can learn something even from a five-year-old child. You know, mm-hmm. you know, just you know, it, it's what is the, it, there's an Arab you know. proverb like what you don't find in uh, oceans, you sometimes find in rivers and streams, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's 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 difficult. It takes humility. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying I'm humble, but I I sat with scholars, Christian scholars, that I had massive difference of opinion, but I I didn't argue with them. I just I wanted to know why do you believe what you believe. Mm-hmm. I learned languages from them. I learned theology from them. Mm-hmm. It's very difficult to do for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, th- it's it's difficult for us to have an intra-faith dialogue, let alone go into a church and, yeah. you know, it's hard to sit with, you know, a, a Shi'i brother and, right. and, 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 you know, um, and, and talk about things in a respectful way, obviously. Um, but this is something we have to do, mm-hmm. you know. The That's Quran right. has a very large heart and... Um, it's beautiful. And, yeah, and it's... And, it's uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a lot more merciful than we are. So we have to keep that in mind when we read the hadith, when we read the Quran, um, and, uh, and you know, sort of broaden our, like I said, our hermeneutical parameters. Mm-hmm. You know, we can, we can do that. That's scholarship. Mm-hmm. And still stay true to the message of the Prophet ﷺ. Mm. But, 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 you know, we, we should push for rigor, rigorous scholarship, especially in, these, in this uh, arena of comparative theology, um, uh, because again, I don't think the Quran can be understood. I mean, this is just my opinion. I don't think the Quran can be understood adequately without biblical studies, because of context. Because of context, exactly. Yeah, it, it just cannot be understood. Well, and I've and, and I've, I think I've even said this on the show, or maybe it was it was the last time. I mean, you know, o- oftentimes when the Quran does talk about, or this was a conversation you and I had, Zaki, sure. on the show though. Um, so it wasn't the last time we had Dr. Atai on, but um, the, the, when, when the Quran talks about a lot of this, a, a lot of the a, a lot of the narratives that are common to you know um, mm-hmm. biblical ones or ones that we find in the Torah, yeah. um, it deals with it in a very again truncated referential manner because it it, it assumed that you the audience the, exactly. would know the details. It assumes so, a full knowing reader, exactly as Carl Ernst would say. There you go. Yeah, it, right. it assumes that you that you have your stuff together. That's right. That's that right. You're so familiar uh, with the conversation. I, I, and I give this <laughs> analogy in, in, in classes where I where I where I talk about this, or in, in contexts where I've talked where I've spoken about this, which is, you know, if I if I say Clark Kent and Superman, like you know, without even if you're not a even if you're not a comic book buff, or if you're not a film buff, you know the story. You get the general idea of what I'm what I'm talking about. Mm. Because it's so much in the milieu, right? I mean, it's, you you absorbed mm-hmm. enough of, of, of culture to yeah. be able to to, to 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 know what I'm referring to, yeah. and so the Quran kind of adopts that similar approach. Where look, you, I don't need to. We the Quran doesn't need to go into the details, the numbers, right. the dates, etc. Right. Because the audience, that initial response audience, and certainly it assumes that we are well informed readers at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, know the story, know the details, yeah. and can flesh it out for themselves. Definitely. So, 
you know, and again, to, if I could quote you from I, what I've heard you say previously, you know, much like in real estate, it's location, location, location. Oh yeah. You know, hermeneutics is all about, and, and scriptural interpretation is all is is all about context, context, context. Exactly. So I think. Yeah. 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 Definitely. I mean, if you look at the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, I mean, it's the most detailed story in the Quran. It is. Yeah. Right. Um, it's the one exception I, I always yeah, say. Yeah, but it nowhere near the detail. There's still, I mean, there's an right. interesting, who was it? Um, I think his name was Robert Alder um, or something like that. Is UC Berkeley, sort of the Hebrew Bible guy at UC Berkeley. Okay. Where he says, you know, he says like the, the, the story of Yusuf in the Torah is written with a certain um, slant uh, or emphasis, I should say, uh, towards fraternity towards, you know, tribal solidarity, brotherhood, because that's what Bani Israel needed to hear. Mm -hmm. The Quranic worldview is, is more ecumenical. So it's the same story, but it's a different emphasis. It's not necessarily canceling. It's not a corrective of the biblical story. Mm -hmm. And this is a point that Imam al-Biqa'i makes as well, who affirms the text of the Bible, um, where he says that, uh, you know, that that these 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 qisas, these narrations are being universalized. Mm. So there there's a different point of emphasis at times. For example, in the Yusuf story in Genesis, you know, Joseph is in jail and um, you know, his cellmates, they have those dreams, those visions, and they ask him for the interpretation and straight away he gives the interpretation. That's it. In the Quran, he says, Let me tell you something first, and then he gives them Tawheed. Right, mm -hmm. because the Quran is more ecumenical. Mm -hmm. It's trying to appeal to a larger audience. Mm -hmm. um, it's trying to establish Tawheed first and foremost amongst the Arabs. Um, so it's not necessarily a contradiction, but it's a different point of emphasis. That's right. So I think that's what's happening with with many stories in the Quran, including the the Exodus story as well. And right. in the Quran, you know, it's you know, in the, in the Bible, it's again more tribal. Let my people go. In the Quran, won't you let me guide you? Speak mm -hmm. the Pharaoh a qawlan layin, a, a, gentle, yeah, word. a gentle word. Perhaps he might fear mm -hmm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, you know, it's not inconceivable to, to say that in the Quranic version of the Exodus, many, many Egyptians also made the Exodus with Moses because he was proselytizing <laughs> the faith to them. He was yeah. calling them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So right. it's not just, you know, Israelites leaving Egypt. It's believers leaving Egypt and those believers were well even the even the priests in the in in in, in Pharaoh in, in, in mm -hmm. the Pharaoh's court exactly right? they, they the magicians they bow down in, they in did, yeah. prostration because yeah. of they, exactly. they, they believed in the validity of uh, right. the, the Moses' prophecy yeah. and you have the, the tradition of Asia in our that's right in our tradition that's right the wife of Pharaoh who's probably Hatshepsut I mean there's I have to do more research on this but there there is a there is a a, a, a a tradition of an Egyptian queen pharaoh who, uh, who, um, whose tomb and memory was desecrated and trying to you know, attempted to be written out of history for mm -hmm. some reason. Her name was Hatshepsut, but we have to. I, I mean, I, I teach a class at Zaytuna called Seminal Ancient Texts, and we went through sort of the timeline, and it could work, but mm, I don't remember the details right now, but. There might be some, there's probably some, obviously right. there is some historical basis for that story because it's mentioned in the Quran, we believe it's a true story. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, and you mentioned, you know, context in this kind of ecumenical approach. I mean, to mm -hmm. me, the ultimate proof of that is, you know, a, lo a lot of, uh, even what the, when the Quran does deal with these biblical narratives and so on, mm -hmm. um, they are in the Medinan context. Yeah, Meccan verses don't speak of uh, Ahl Kitab and, yeah. and don't speak. I mean, e correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean most of the of what we of we glean mm. from the Quran of these stories comes in the Medinan context because mm -hmm. here the Prophet is in fact, you know, conversing mm. with Jews and Christians yeah. for the first time. Whereas in in Mecca, it's you know, right. there's not a, a standing faith community right. of Jews and Christians. That's true. Yeah. 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 Um, I think it's a great place. I mean, every, I think every time we get to a point, I was, uh, you know, I, I think of more things to ask, but I think uh, well, well, I'll save it for another day. We'll have to have you back for more <laughs> unfinished business. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. This is uh, great, though. Oh, my yeah. gosh. No, this thank you so much uh, <laughs> for, for, one, agreeing to come back so soon. I mean, I reached out to Dr. Atai, and I was like, I thought I wouldn't, I wouldn't get a response or something. You're like, really? You want me back? And like, <laughs> no, wasn't, I, wasn't I just on deja vu? But no, really. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time. Oh, I know okay. it's... Not, my mind was racing based on something, Zachy, something of John McLean and <laughs> John the Apostle. I, I, I think that there is <laughs> there is an analysis of 
the first Die Hard that uh, I think right. could, could certainly yeah. allow for yeah. for a deeper reading. I think there's a lot yeah. in that well, first one. Yeah. Sorry, I, I'm going to ask one more thing because you, you, you made me think of this, and, and <laughs> which is, what would you say to the argument that that that, that, that has Christmas? I mean, we oh. are recording this on the day after Christmas, mm-hmm. yeah. Boxing Day, as mm-hmm. I'm told it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and Zaki has a reason why it's called Boxing Day, which I just thought it was a Canadian holiday, but you're saying. Oh, it's like where you... I, I'm pretty sure. I mean, anyway. I'm happy to be proven wrong, yeah. but yeah. That Christmas has become so thoroughly secularized mm. that that can, can Muslims have Christmas trees <laughs> and believe in Santa Claus? Wow. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, this is something you yeah. hear from people. Yeah. You know, I, I, I would say no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, the whole concept of Santa Claus is, I mean... Yeah. I, 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 I just wouldn't advocate lying to children, no matter what right. it is. Okay, yeah. Unless it's yeah. absolutely necessary, yeah. you know. I mean, I went to the mall a, a few weeks ago, and mm-hmm. my daughter's four, and mm-hmm. she said, "Oh, you know, what's what's going on?" And mm-hmm. sort of explained uh, Santa Claus, and then she kind of just, you know, brushed it off. And then a few days later, she's like, "You know, when, when's Santa Claus coming?" And mm-hmm. I said, "Well, you know, there's not really Santa. D- Daddy is daddies are are Santa Claus. <laughs> they dress up like." She still didn't quite get it. Yeah, but you know the Christmas tree. I mean, it's interesting. Jehovah's Witness. You know they don't be- they don't yeah. have Christmas trees. Yeah. I mean, there's there's a there's a verse in Jeremiah chapter ten verse two, or is it two ten? I think I'm transposing the <laughs> book and verse, but it says uh, it says follow not the way of the heathen, who brings in trees from the forest into their homes and deck them out with gold and silver. Mm. So this was a, a an ancient p- pagan practice, but you said it's so secularized now that people don't know the. They don't know the origins of these right. things anymore, and I That's mean, I've, right. I've even heard things that it's permissible to go trick or treating and things like. I'm not going to say who, who has those opinions, but <laughs> right. yeah, I, generally for me personally, I, w- yeah. I would I would just be safe and yeah. caution against. I mean, yeah, I mean, it becomes a slippery slope. But I'll perhaps. tell you this: uh-huh. I love I love the holiday season. Um, I everything smells great, and you know everything looks beautiful, yeah. and. And, uh, you know, I love Isa alayhi salam, and, you know, it's, um, I uh, remember him in my heart on December 25th. He probably wasn't bo- born on December 25th, yeah. Yeah. Uh, most likely. Yeah. Uh, I think it was Constantine in the 4th century who instituted December 25th as the, as the birthday of, of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's the molid of a, of a great prophet, mm. and, um, you know, so... As they say, every day is Christmas. I guess, you know, so, uh, Allahu <laughs> Alam. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank I you think for I think that is a perfect place a- to leave that. that. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Um, so thank you, listeners. And uh, you, if you have any questions, comments, uh, feedback, uh, please do email us at diffusecongruence at gmail dot com. Um, you can also find us on Facebook, facebook dot com slash diffusecongruence. Um, and as always, especially during this time of the wonderful holidays, uh, and not to mention towards the end of the year, where you where you, where you can make. Uh, um, uh, your charitable contributions, please do visit our Patreon page and support the show. Um, every little bit helps, and we want to we want to thank those who have done so already and uh, become patrons of the show. So thank you so much for making all of this happen. And uh, just to wrap things up, thank you, Doctor Ty, and uh, thank you so much. Thank, uh, thanks everybody for making 2018 yeah. really awesome. Yeah, this and is our last show of the uh, year, most this likely. Is, this is uh, inshallah the last show of this year, but inshallah we'll be back uh, in a few weeks with. Uh, uh, hopefully, a uh, bold new start to the bold new Bold new start, uh, our 75th episode, which will be some sort of anniversary. Wow. And, and, and yeah, in, into 2019. So, upwards of the